This month, more than a dozen First Nations in Ontario will vote to ratify what's called the Anishinaabek Nation Governance Agreement. It transfers jurisdiction in four key areas to the Anishinaabek Nation. Our northeastern Ontario hubs journalist Nick Dunn has been looking into how much support the move has, and he joins us now from our studio at Laurentian University in Sudbury for more. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jan. All right, Nick, so let's start with what's the status quo now for First Nations in Ontario? Yeah, sure. And this applies to First Nations for the most part across the country. So uh, the governing legislature uh, is the Indian Act, which was implemented in 1876. Um, this effectively defines the relationship between uh, the Indigenous people in Canada and uh, the government of Canada. So um, this is what created the reserve system. It's what created the band council system. But it's also what created the residential schools and um, a whole litany of uh, discriminatory policies. Now, uh, there have been num a number of amendments made to the Indian Act, most notably in the 50s and the 70s, that got rid of some of these more overtly discriminatory uh, parts mm -hmm. of the, the Indian Act. But many still feel that it is a uh, paternalistic uh, piece of legislation that really kind of controls uh, rather than allows First Nations to, you know, govern and effectively provide services. Now, the Anishinaabe Nation could potentially become a regional government. Can you give us an idea of what its current purpose is right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as it stands, the Anishinaabe Nation is a political advocacy group for 40 First Nations across the province. We're talking as far south as Omjanong First Nation, which is near Sarnia, which goes all and it goes all the way around the Great Lakes to uh, all the way to Fort William First Nation near Thunder Bay. Um, and uh, yeah, as a governing body, it would uh, oversee um, you know, some of the finances, it would bring the federal transfer payments to those individual First Nations that ratify the agreement, and it would also negotiate with the government on further areas of jurisdiction. Now, off the top, I had mentioned that there are gonna be four key governance areas that will be handed over to First Nations. Can we delve into that? What, what's that looking like? Yeah, yeah, so that's that's absolutely the meat and potatoes of this. Um, so the first thing to look at is uh, uh, jurisdiction over elections. So currently under the Indian Act, uh, the standard band council election cycle is two years, uh, which makes it very difficult for long-term planning because you know, your first year on a council, you're being assigned portfolios, uh, getting the, you know, getting the hang of uh, how everything works. But then by the second year, uh, you're already looking at re-election and, you know, when a new council comes in, you know, different, you know, positions come about and uh, it becomes very difficult to have long-term planning done. So uh, this allows First Nations to modify things like, for example, the band council election cycle. Um, the next thing is citizenship. So, for example, um, this would allow First Nations to create their own citizenship code. And this is different to the uh, federal uh, Indian, uh, the status Indian registry. Um, this allows First Nations to define who exactly is a member of their First Nation mm -hmm. and allows uh, First Nations to advocate uh, for funding on programs based on their citizenship lists and numbers, which would be uh, less restrictive than, uh, f you know, the federal status Indian registry, which has in the past discriminated against, discriminated against people and, um, you know, left a number of people out of, um, you know, being a status Indian under the federal government. Now, this has been in work since 1995, correct? What's taken so long? Yes, it's been a very long process. Uh, this is when the federal government was starting to implement its inherent rights policy, so recognizing the right to self-government. And so this process has taken a very long time. You know, there's a lot of community consultation that gets involved, you know, forming, say, um, your constitution, you know, all the things that uh, the First Nations want out of these self-governance agreements, self-governance agreements, rather, and, um, you know, negotiating with the federal government. I mean, people on the Anishinaabe Nation have come and gone from this, and federal governments have changed. So uh, the priorities have naturally changed when it comes to these agreements. So that's all to say that this has been a long time um, kind of in the works. Now, you spoke to people in your article that's up on tbo.org who support ratification, but you also spoke to people who are concerned that it's still not enough. What are the main concerns here? All right, so to boil down the biggest concern, it's about um, implementing the constitutional Aboriginal right to self-government. 
Um, you got to think about it this way. So uh, in Section 35 of the Constitution, it lays out a series, it lays out unique rights to uh, Indigenous people in Canada. However, the Constitution does not define these. Mm -hmm. So there are several options here. So in the 80s, they were supposed to figure this out in a first minister's conference, but the clock more or less ran out on that and they did not come to a definition of what self-government looks like. Uh, so the next two options are these agreements or through court. Now court, they can explore the legal definition of self-government. Um, this has wide, this right has wide ranging consequences about the delivery of services and how people express their political mm -hmm. will. So uh, there, there, there are significant implications in exploring this right. Uh, however, this process is extremely expensive. It's very long. And, um, you know, First Nations would have a difficulty, um, you know, given the historical economic dispossession uh, that's occurred over the past, you know, century um, in fighting this. Um, so what the government uh, has provided is effectively a settlement on this, you know. You, 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 mm -hmm. you, you, you take a divorce, you know, you could either settle on it or you can fight for what you want. And this is effectively a settlement. Uh, and there are concerns that, you know, questions of things like self-determination uh, aren't being addressed here because, you know, are we going to use the uh, federally imposed Indian Ban Council or are we going to use the, you know, some kind of, you know, structure of governance that self, that First Nations rather can form for themselves, you know, to express their political will. With that being said, it looks like the vote is going through, but can you break it, break it down a little bit as to what the next steps are? Yeah, absolutely. So this vote will be taking place throughout the entirety of February. There are 15 First Nations up in this first round of ratification votes. There will be a second one taking place through May. And as of now, there are eight First Nations in that um, round of ratification votes. And from there, it's about, um, you know, finding out how many uh, communities ratify and beginning to form what this regional government is supposed to look like. Um, you know, certain details about the structure of the governance and how each First Nation gets represented, represented rather, in, um, you know, this regional government, the Anishinaabek Nation, has still has to be sorted out. So there are still a number of processes here, but uh, this is definitely the biggest step, you know, since 1995 of getting this uh, through. Nick, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And of course, we'll keep a close eye on this story. Thanks again. That's Nick Dunn, our Northeastern Hub journalist. Thanks for having me, Jan. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.